Good morning, everybody. Take your Bible, turn to the book of Galatians, if you would, please. And if you wouldn't, do it anyway. We're going to deal with, we started on this last Sunday morning. We're going to deal with the world's largest cult. World's largest cult. Galatians chapter 1. Um, I got this on my mind. I was telling Wayne this earlier. Um, our country is, is in desperate need of the gospel. Desperate need. Um, I was reading in preparing for the message this morning. I'm going to preach uh, about the Declaration of Independence and what, what was the mindset behind the men that framed it. Men like Samuel Adams, John Adams, um, e even Benjamin Franklin, uh, who was, Benjamin Franklin was not a Christian. Um, but he had reverence and respect for the Bible and for biblical principles. And uh, let me give you a little history. And I've, I've mentioned this before. When, after we won the Revolutionary War, when the Constitutional Congress had convened and they were trying to write up our Constitution, they got into a, they got into sort of a gridlock. And there was no agreement, there was no, uh, there was no progress being done. And so it was Benjamin Franklin, of all people, who stood up and he recognized what was going on. And what he said was, um, if, if we believe the Bible, if we believe that not even a sparrow can fall from the sky without God knowing about it and doing something about it, then how can we believe that we can build a nation without God's help? And so what he suggested was that each and every member of Congress go, go back home, find their minister, spend time reading the scripture, praying and fasting, and when that time has elapsed, come back and let's see what can be done, and each member did that. They went back home. Many of those men were committed Christians. They were, they were committed members of their church. And when they came back, they wrote what ended up being the greatest governmental document that mankind has ever seen, aside from the law that God gave to Moses for Israel. But it was based upon those laws. It was based upon those principles. And um, I read something last night about General George Washington and the faith that he had. And speaking of the, um, the gay pride parade that's going on this morning, General Washington was actually brought a man, one of his officers, who was accused of attempting sodomy on another soldier. And they had his trial, found him guilty, and they literally, with a ceremony, they drummed him out of the military. They said, this kind of stuff is not going to happen in my army. If we anticipate winning this war, then we must have God on our side. And uh, you just don't find that kind of faith very much anymore in America. What a shame, amen? All right, Galatians chapter 1. Everything, everything has to do with the gospel. Everything does. So Paul said in Galatians chapter 1 verse 6, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven, preach 
any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. We examine the teachings and doctrines of the Mormon church. We looked a little bit at the teachings of the Seventh-day Adventist church. And what we have found is a common, a common scenario. Each one of these cults received their doctrine, not from the scriptures, but from a, an angel or a pretended angel or whatever, some form of spirit that appeared and told, one of them told Joseph Smith, all the churches are wrong, they don't have the right gospel, there is actually another testament and I'm going to show you where it's located. Same thing with Ellen White. Ellen White, who was a woman, the first, first book I ever read from her, the initials, there was just the initials, E.G. White. I didn't know what I had. And it was a book on prophecy. And this is years ago. So I thought, well, I'll read this book on prophecy. I didn't know I was reading Ellen White's manifesto on the Seventh-day Adventist church. But anyway, we saw that Ellen White was, according to her own claim, in a vision, contacted by an angel, and an angel showed her that the fourth commandment was not one of the commandments that were nailed to the cross. That everybody must strictly adhere to going to church only on Saturday. And if you go to church on Sunday, according to Seventh-day Adventist teaching, you have the mark of the beast. That's the mark of the beast is going to church on Sunday. That's what they say. So their accusation is against us that all of us are carrying the mark of the beast because we go to church on Sunday. And it's not true. So what is, the, what is the true gospel? The gospel is that we are saved by grace alone through faith alone and not of the works of the law. It is not by adherence or strict adherence or any kind of adherence to the laws that God gave in the scripture. We are incapable of fulfilling the law and our, fl our flesh won't let us. We try and we strive and we work toward that because that's what's in our heart but we're going to fail. If you, if you succeed in keeping the law a hundred times on the 101st attempt, you're going to fail. And because of that, when you break one law, James said you've broken the law, period. Um, and it's that way in our courts. If you break a law, you have to go to court. You have to answer to the court system. So it's the, it's the same. So the gospel is that we are saved not by what we do, we are saved by what we believe. Okay, and that's the simplicity of the gospel. That's what makes it free to every man. That's what, that's what ensures that everybody, doesn't matter how capable they are or how incapable they are, it doesn't matter how smart they are, it doesn't matter even if they can read millions of people who could not read but heard the gospel preached to them. They can be saved. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So that's the gospel. So we talked about these alleged Marian apparitions where supposedly Mary appears. This is an actual photograph, they say, of the Virgin Mary appearing I don't know if it is or not, but even if it is, I'm telling you, that's not Mary. Amen. It's not Mary. What is it then? If it's not Mary, what is it? It's a familiar spirit. And God told Israel, do not follow after those who follow familiar spirits. Don't listen to their teaching. Don't listen to their doctrine. When they tell you to go after other God. Boy, I'm getting wound up here. Turn to Deuteronomy 13. Let me show you this. When God said, thou shalt have no other gods before me, he was not joking. He wasn't kidding. When you place, when you pray to something else other than God, you have put a God between you and the real God. You have... The law said, thou shalt have no other gods before me. So when you, when you pray to something that is not God, in hopes that that will pray to God, 
You have put another God between you and God. Now, there's nothing wrong with you asking me, Pastor, will you pray for me? Absolutely, I'll pray. But you know what I'll tell you? You pray too. Because there's nothing in Scripture that says that God won't hear your prayer, but he'll listen to mine. There's nothing there. God is a God who listens for man to pray, to call upon the name. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, is what Romans 10 says, and other places. So in Deuteronomy 13, he says in verse 1, If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and that's what that is. That's a sign or a wonder. It's a wonder. There's, an, there's something appearing up in midair. And the sign of the wonder come to pass where he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods, plural, which thou hast not known, let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto that words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So when the Catholic Church says that you can pray to St. Joseph, St. Mary, St. Peter, St. Paul, St. Jude, St. Thomas, St. Ignatius de Loyola, founder of the Jesuit order, St. Mother Teresa, when the church tells you that you can pray to them and that you should pray to them because then they will take it right to Jesus and tell Jesus to quit being angry with you. Jesus is not the one angry with you. He didn't come to judge, he came to save. And he still offers salvation, he offers it free. So anyway, uh, we looked at the Mujagorja apparitions in Bosnia last Sunday. Here's another one. Lord's France, 1858. The official website says, Our Lady appeared 18 times to Bernadette Subiru, a young, poor, and sick girl in the grotto of Mazabiel, close to Lord's in France in 1858. She asked for a chapel to be built on the site of the apparitions, and when asked who she was, she said, I am the Immaculate Conception. That's wicked. Because the claim is that Mary was born without sin. We talked about that last Sunday. She was born without sin, according to them. She is the Immaculate Conception. They call her the Mother of God. That also is an abomination and unscriptural. So, um, here's the, the Virgin Mary appearing along with the saints, quote-unquote, at Fatima. If you've ever heard of the... Fatima secret. Supposedly the Virgin Mary gave these prophetic secrets to, to a group of children. So the website says, In preparation for the apparitions of Our Lady, an angel who called himself the Angel of Portugal. Let me tell you who that is. That's a principality. A prince. Just like in the book of Daniel, you'll see the prince of Persia. Or the prince of the people of Israel, who is Michael. You have the prince of the power of the air in Ephesians chapter 2, which is the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So what this was, was not necessarily a good angel. It was a principality of Portugal who first spoke to the children saying, don't be afraid, I'm the angel of peace. Who is the prince of peace? Jesus. Do you see what's going on here? This is a replacement for Jesus. Pray with me. He then knelt on the ground, bending forward until his forehead touched it, and prayed, My God, I believe, I adore, and I love you. I beg pardon of you for those who do not believe, do not adore, do not hope, and do not love you. He said this prayer three times. When he stood then, he said to the children, Pray thus, the hearts of Jesus and Mary are attentive to the voice of your supplications. He's placed Mary in with Christ. He left the children who then began to say this prayer frequently. Why frequently? Because they believe that God is heard in your much speaking. What did Jesus say to us about prayer? When you pray, do not follow after the heathen and do vain repetitions. So the Catholic Church will tell you that because you sinned this sin, Christ didn't forgive all of it. You have to atone for the rest of it. So you must atone for that by praying 30 Hail Marys, 30 Our Fathers, in other words, you must, that's the purpose of a rosary. You take the rosary, hold it in your hand, and when your fingers are on one bead, you say the Hail Mary. 
Then you move to the next bead. That beads help you keep track of how many times you prayed it. So they'll tell you to pray the rosary, which means as many beads as are on that rosary, that's how many times you have to pray. Because they teach that God is heard in your much speaking. If you keep repeating the prayers, then God will hear it. That's a lie. It's a stupid lie. It's a lie. For however bad I felt last Sunday, I'm going to double it today. He left the children and began to pray this. In the final apparition of the angel, he brought a chalice, which he suspended in the air. That's a sign or a wonder. And above it, there was a host. The host is the Eucharist. The bread that they say literally becomes the crucified body of Jesus Christ, which is a lie. Drops of blood were falling from the host into the chalice. That also, that's a sign or a wonder. Before offering the host to Lucia, Saint Lucia, the only one who had received First Communion, he prostrated himself on the ground and said, Most Holy Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, I adore you profoundly and offer you the most precious body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, present in all the tabernacles of the earth. That's a lie. God does not dwell in temples made with hands. In the Catholic Church, there's this little box that they keep the Eucharist in. They, oh, that's called a tabernacle that was built by man. And they say God dwells in there, and it's a lie. So in reparation for the outrages, sacrileges, and indifference with which he himself is offended, and through the infinite merits of the, his most sacred heart and of the immaculate heart of Mary, I beg of you the conversion of poor sinners. He repeated this prayer three times, then rising up, lifting the host, and looking at it, he said, Take and drink the body and blood of Jesus Christ, horribly insulted by ungrateful men. Make reparation for their crimes and console your God. Turn to Acts chapter 15. This got me fired up. And something I found out yesterday, and it's, I'm, my mind is on the message this morning. It's not just in St. Louis they're having pride parades. It is literally everywhere around the world for some reason this month. My guess is it has something to do with the summer solstice. Because a lot of the heathen practices, they follow the observation of times. They do things during certain star arrangements. Uh, Acts chapter 15. Here's, here's the problem with partaking of the Catholic Mass. If you get invited to a Catholic funeral, you can go, but don't eat their junk don't eat it and I'm going to show you why in Acts chapter 15 the apostles the elders bishops of the churches without a pope got together they didn't have a pope they didn't need a pope God did not ordain a pope there was no one man in charge the Holy Ghost was going to lead these men as they took counsel together on how to deal with the issue of the Gentiles being saved. And the issue was, should the Gentiles follow the law and be circumcised and then keep all the feasts and then, and then keep all the law? James, at this council, stood up and said, Men and brethren, why are we wanting to cast a yoke of bondage upon the Gentiles that we ourselves were not able to bear? In other words, we didn't keep the law. So why are we throwing it on the Gentiles that they had to keep the law? Because we never did. That's why Jesus had to come and die for us, because we didn't keep the law. So they considered all that. They heard the testimony of Peter, how he went to Cornelius' house. Cornelius was a Gentile. Cornelius and his whole house got saved. And then the Holy Ghost came down, and they all spoke with these languages, just like they did in the days of the apostles and the, on the day of Pentecost. And Peter said, the Holy Ghost fell on them, the same way it fell on us, and they weren't keeping the law. So we say that without the works of the law, Gentiles can be saved if they're saved by faith. So um, look at verse 19 of Acts 15. Here's what they wrote to the Gentile churches. Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that, number one, they abstain from the pollutions of idols. Do not. Pray to an image. Do not bow to it. 
Do not think that that is Jesus. I even uh, was, uh, there was a family that years ago we had kind of worked with and dealing with homeschool issues and Christian school issues. And they were a good family, but they belonged to this Lutheran church out in Horine. Well, their son was killed in a car accident, so I went to the funeral at that church. And I was stunned. I did not know this. I'm sitting there, and I see up on the stage this huge statue of Jesus sitting on a throne up in the back of the stage. And I'm going, I don't think that's right. So then I thought, well, I won't judge yet. So then the service started, and the Lutheran priest comes in through the back door, and he's got a prayer book, and he's reading a prayer, and he's walking down the aisle, and when he gets to the stage, he stops stands in front of the statue and he's reading this prayer to that statue and I'm going, okay, that's breaking the command. That's what God said, don't do that. And I'd never, I'd never seen anything like that before in my life. I thought Protestants didn't have idols. Apparently they do. But anyway, he said, don't, uh, we're worth we. Verse 20. They abstain from the pollution of idols. Number two, from fornication. Number three, from things strangled or hung. Anything hanging from a tree. So what the Catholic Church does, they got this crucifix, which is the idol shepherd hanging from a tree, and they, they offer the sacrifice before that idol. And he said, don't do that. So, there, and then he said, and st abstain from blood. Don't drink blood. So, when the Catholic Church says, this literally turns into the physical body of Jesus Christ. And this wine literally turns into the physical blood of Jesus Christ. You're then told by the Bible, don't eat that and don't drink that. Don't do it. There's four things here that the rules are to us Gentiles. Yes, we can't keep the law. We, what we do is we go by grace through faith. But four things here he said specific. You think God knew what the Catholic Church was going to impose on millions, billions of people throughout history. Absolutely he knew. And so he specifically gives guidelines for us to not violate ourselves with that. Not to have that doctrine or that practice in our churches. Specifically that. So here you have this Saint Mary telling everybody, take and drink the body and blood of Jesus Christ, make reparation for their crimes and console your God. It's telling you a false gospel. Then we have... Um, the first apparition of Our Lady occurred on May 13th. Our Lady appeared floating on a cloud... Think about that. How's Jesus coming when he returns? In a cloud, people. Our Lady appeared floating on a cloud, surrounded by bright light and holding a rosary. She said, don't be afraid, I won't hurt you. In the apparition of July, Our Lady said the children, sacrifice yourselves for sinners and repeat often. Sacrifice yourselves for sinners. Especially whenever you make a sacrifice for them. Oh Jesus, it is for love of you, for the conversion of sinners and reparation for the sins committed against the Immaculate Heart of Mary. She also confided with them with three very important secrets which, were, which they were to keep until further notice. She also predicted to give a great sign on the future apparition in Oct October. When you pray the rosary, say after each mystery, oh, oh my Jesus, forgive us, save us from the fire of hell, lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need of your mercy. False, got that rosary is a false gospel. And here you have an angel appearing and telling them to do this. 1973, the Blessed Virgin Mary gave Sister Agnes Katsuko Sasagawa in Akita, Japan, three messages through a statue of Mary. Bathed in a brilliant light, the statue became alive and spoke with a voice of indescribable beauty. Her guardian angel also appeared and taught her to pray. And here's what the, this angel said. My daughter, my novice, you have obeyed me well in abandoning all to follow me. Is the infirmity of your ears painful? 
Your deafness will be healed. Be sure. Be patient. It is the last trial. Does the wound of your hand cause you to suffer? Pray in reparation for the sins of men. Each person in this community is my irreplaceable daughter. Do you say well the prayer of the handmaids of the Eucharist? Then let us pray it together. Most sacred heart of Jesus, truly present in the Holy Eucharist, I consecrate my body and soul to be entirely one with your heart, being sacrificed at every instant on all altars of the world and giving praise to the Father, pleading for the coming of his kingdom. They're teaching that your sacrifice can also go toward the sins of sinners. That's an abomination. Man, I'm fired up today. Most sacred heart of Jesus, truly present in the Holy Eucharist, I consecrate my body and soul to be entirely one with your heart, being sacrificed at every instance. I already read that. Use me as you will for the glory of the Father and the salvation of souls. Most holy mother of God. That's an abomination. Never let me be separated from your divine son. Please defend and protect me as your special child. Amen. And there you have the idol. Our lady manifested herself through this statue. This uh, Sister Agnes Sasagawa in Akita, Japan. Wicked stuff. Many men in this world afflict the Lord. This is what she said. I desire souls to console him to soften the anger of the Heavenly Father. I wish with my son for souls who will repair by their suffering and their poverty for the sinners and ingrates. So here's one thing the Catholic Church does very well. They convince their loyal followers that being in poverty is best for them. And whatever money they get in, if they give that to the Catholic Church, then that itself will help pay for their own sins. It keeps them in poverty. If you wonder why third world nations are so impoverished, the Catholic Church is one of the reasons why they are. And predominantly south of the American border, from Mexico down through Central America into South America, they are predominantly Roman Catholic. Predominantly. And these poor people are told that their poverty is part of their paying for their own sins, and if they do ever flourish and get money in, give it to the Catholic Church because that'll help pay for your sins. This stuff's wicked, people. The largest cult in the world. One billion people in this world claim to be Roman Catholics. Now, do I hate them? No. I do not hate one of them. I'm not real happy with the priests who promote this. But I don't hate Roman Catholics. I think they ought to have the opportunity to be saved like everybody else. Joe used to be a Roman Catholic. Some of you others, some of you watching online, at one time, God brought you out of the Roman Catholic Church. Teach you the real Jesus. Um, let's see here. In order that the world might know his anger, the Heavenly Father is preparing to inflict a great chastisement on all mankind. With my son, I, this is what Mary is saying, I have intervened so many a times to appease the wrath of the Father. This is the church teaching that Mary, that God is sitting angry all the time and is ready to wipe the earth of all the sinners, that he hates every one of them. Even though the scriptures say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So that doesn't match then what they're teaching. So then what they're teaching is that it takes, that Jesus is not sufficient for the souls of mankind. It takes Mary to soften the heart of Jesus so that God doesn't wipe them all out. That's what they're teaching. So when she says, I've intervened so many times, that's what's behind that. I have prevented the coming of calamities by offering him the sufferings of the son of the cross, his precious blood and beloved souls who console him and, and form a cohort of victim souls. Prayer, penance, prayer and penance. Remember what penance is. Penance is not just repenting. Penance is you 
suffering or you hurting yourself or afflicting yourself in some way as to atone for your own sins. That's what, that's what that is. Prayer, penance, and courageous sacrifices can soften the Father's anger. That is a lie. Only one sacrifice satisfied the just demands of God. And that was the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross at Calvary. But the Catholic Church says that they are re-sacrificing Christ every time they have a Mass celebration. So, today is Sunday. So, how many Catholic churches are there in the world? How many monasteries? How many convents? Take that then, multiply that by the number of times they'll have Mass today. More than likely, hundreds of thousands of times they claim they are re-crucifying Jesus. Turn your Bible to Hebrews chapter 6. How many times does Jesus have to die? Once. So look at Look at verse 4, Hebrews chapter 6. For it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again under repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh, put him to an open shame. What they're doing is stripping Jesus and crucifying him again, putting him to an open shame again. And it's wicked to do that. Not even when we have communion service here, do we say we are crucifying Jesus over again. We don't do that. We don't believe that. His one time sacrifice is sufficient for salvation to all who believe for eternity. Christ died one time. So it says, even in a secular institute, prayer is necessary. All, already souls who wish to pray are on the way to being gathered. Without attracting too much attention to the form, be faithful and fervent in prayer to console the master. But they're basically saying that Mary then is the one who is protecting mankind from God's wrath. That Mary is, not Jesus. It's another gospel delivered. Uh, go, go back to Galatians 1. It's another gospel delivered. Now, I'm going to ask you this question again while we're reading this verse. Again. If you think of something that I, I haven't touched every form of false gospel. But I asked this question when we started and I'm going to ask it again. If you can think of some church or some cult that gives man a false gospel that's not the gospel uh, that's in our Bibles. In Galatians chapter 1 again, notice what he said in verse 8, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. So if the angel comes and says, here's, a, here's do this, and then do this, and then do this, and if you do that, then you'll be saved. So he said, that's accursed. And then he said, verse 9, as we said before, say, say, oh, now again, if any man preach any other gospel on you than that you have received, let him be cursed. So the angel come down saying it one way, that's a curse there. But then when man on earth repeats that gospel, that false conversion or that false salvation, when a man preaches that and repeats it, he also is accursed. Now, let me give you a little theory that I believe. Whoops. Sorry. Out of time. Here's what I believe. I think angels are going to come down in the future 
And they are going to deceive mankind one last time. I believe angels are going to appear, and they're going to do it in various forms. I mean, think about all the weird stuff that goes on in the world. You have ghosts, you have familiar spirits appearing as Mary or as different angels. You have them appearing as aliens from another planet. You have all of these different things going on, and I think all of these different angels are going to come down in various places. I think, you know, the, the prophet... Um, Mohammed says that an angel came down to him and delivered to him, showed him the, the, the Koran, okay, which is another, it's a false gospel. So I think angels are going to, they're going to descend from heaven. Actually, they're thrown out. They're going to be kicked out of heaven. And as they come down here, they're going to give to the world a different way to immortality. A way to live forever in this body, which I don't want. I hate this body. I hate your body. I hate everybody's body. I hate everybody. I don't want salvation or immortality in this body. I don't want it. I don't want it in this world. Okay, because this is all going to pass away. It's all going to burn with a fervent heat. But that's, that's the promise that's going to be made. We already have scientists working on immortality through genetics, through technology. I mean, it's coming. It's coming fast. I don't know when, don't know what day, what year, don't have a clue. But what I know is this is going to happen again, one last time. Anchor yourself in the word of God so you're not deceived. Father, we ask your blessings on your word. Thank you, God, for a, a good time, Lord, spent learning the scriptures, knowing what this Bible says, being warned about things that are coming, and they're not good things. Father, the day of the Lord is darkness. And I believe, Father, that you have it ordained that your saints are going to shine the brightest in that time of darkness. Father, help us, dear God, to be Christians. To be right with you. Right in our attitude. Right in our righteousness. Father, help us and forgive us, Father, where all we have failed. We thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ at Calvary that sanctifies us. I pray, dear God, that you would renew the inner man daily. And crucify this old man, this old flesh. God, kill it off. Get rid of it. And prepare us for the days that are coming. Open up our eyes and our hearts to you, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen. I'm glad I came.